when I quit quit working at FedEx and 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 and, and bought my first nine juices of cocaine. That's when I knew I was gonna be all right. You knew you was gonna be all right. When and you, and I didn't care if I died or, or whatever. I just wanted to survive and take care of my family. This is a journey. Let me take you on a journey. There will still be the journey. The journey. New sheriff in town, and the name is the journey. Journey. This thing is bigger than Nino Brown. This is the journey. The journey. What is it that moved you? The journey. The journey. The journey. The journey. The journey. The Journey Memphis is being generously supported by Nike's Black Community Commitment and Methodist Laboner Healthcare. Welcome back to another episode of The Journey. I'm your host, Larry Robinson, and today we have a Memphis icon that's grassroots, but mm -hmm. before he's finished, you're going to be like, wow. So listen, mm -hmm. before we go to our guest, I got to give you the quote. And the quote goes a little something like this. Don't aspire to make a living aspire to make a difference. That comes from the great actor Denzel Washington. And to me what that means is, you know, you can always get a job, you can always make a lot of money, but it really doesn't matter until you make a difference in other people's lives. And so today, why that quote is important is this gentleman, Renardo Baker, is doing just that. <laughs> Memphis born, Memphis bred, I got to call it out. It's Orange Mound Brothers. <laughs> Orange Mound Brother. Um, former athlete, former rapper, St. Nardo, for those who know. <laughs> uh, committed man of God. And for real, I mean committed man of God. Great friend, husband, and a tremendous dad. He's a dad to many. So without further ado, my brother. Renardo yes, Baker. How you doing? What's up, man? <laughs> Good seeing you, man. You too. You man, too. I listen, I, I I went to a meeting, brother, and they talking about your foundation and the work you're doing in the community. But before we go through all of that and we could get there in our second segment, mm -hmm. let me get a little background. First, you was raised in Orange Mound. Is that mm -hmm. is that from the moment you were born? Is that where you 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 know family and you grew up or is that just, is that where you guys matriculated to? Well, um, I was born in Gary, Indiana. Oh. And so my mother brought me down here to Memphis. Okay. Because it was, you know, it was a little dangerous up there during that time. Right. So truly I've been in Memphis probably since I was about three years old. Now, wait a minute. You sit here and saw my script say Memphis born, <laughs> and you just ain't gonna, you just gonna let me just go on and say it and let hey. everybody know I don't know what I'm no, talking about. You know what you're talking about. Oh, okay. At the end of the day, that's only three years. Oh, so okay, okay. The rest of the, the years of my life, hey, I've been here, so. Okay, okay. You, you can say in so many words. Born and bred. Yes, sir. All right, all right. I don't yes, feel sir. so bad now. I don't feel so bad. <laughs> all right, Renardo, who outside the home had the biggest impact on young Renardo? Outside the home. My, 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 my home is in the hood. Really? You give, me, give me a shout out. Who took care of you? Who, who watched out for young Renardo? My, it was multiple. Uh, from a guy named Big Brian to uh, my partner Reggie. Um, when I when I hit like a hard spot in my life, uh -huh. they really was there. You okay. know, I had a few uncles, but the the real impact came from them. Okay, because with them I learned how to be a man and not depend on other people, not depend on my uncles, not depend on my mama. But mm. they 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 showed me how to survive mm. as as a as a young person. Okay, so. Okay. That, that, those ones was more impactful. Oh, wow. So here's one. What decision did you make as a young person that ended up having a lifelong impact, although you didn't really realize it at the time? Well, uh, it was a, a Sunday night, and, uh, and I, was, I was broke. I already had my first son at the uh, age of 15. Um, I had my second son on the way. And- uh, Wait a minute, how old were you? I was, well my second son didn't come until like I was 19. 19, yeah. okay. So, 
during that time, it was a Sunday night, and and the guys I hung hung around was drug dealers. Okay. And so, but I just hung around them. You know, mm -hmm. I had a car, so I was able to take them where they needed to go and things like that. Okay. And um, so one night, I ended up supposing to take some drugs to another individual. Okay. But the individual didn't want them because he was he was like, nah, though these rocks too small. I can't do nothing with these. And I said, okay. So I called my partner and I was like, hey, he said that the rock's too small here. Well, he said, well, you keep them and I get them, I get them back from it. And so that night I was sitting in the bed and I had these 10 rocks in my hand and I was just like, thought I was talking to God. Uh -huh. And I was like, man, I'm, I'm, I got another child on the way. I'm, I'm, I'm in debt, $5,000 in debt. Cause when I called my father who stayed in California uh -huh. to ask for help, he would say, he called me Dwayne. He said, Dwayne, you made them bills. You got to pay those bills. With no no guidance of how to come out of my situation. Oh, wow. But left that responsibility upon me. Right. And so uh, so I had these 10 rocks and, and I heard this voice tell me, you know, all the junkies in the, in the hood. You know where they at. Go out there and sell these rocks. And so that Sunday night. I got out there, I sold 10 rocks. I made $140. I made $40 profit. And I called my partner and I said, hey, I need 14 more rocks. And from that, from that point on, is where I'm at now. So that was your moment you got into the game? Yep. Oh, wow. wow. And, the way, and the way I came up was that, I, you know, I was good in, in, in math in school. Right. And so... You know, back then it was like I always, you know, you say a 10 for the 100, a 5 for the 100, but that's to other dealers. Mm -hmm. And so I was like, why would I sell that to my competition? Mm -hmm. So what I end up doing to the to the uh, the people that was buying with junk, as, as they call them, right. I ended up selling them 7 for the 100. Mm. And so by me doing that, I ended up having five dope houses. It, where I controlled, where it was other dope boys sitting in there with rocks, but the junkies wouldn't buy from them. They'll call me because they was able to get more and break it down and sell it to the other person. Oh, wow. Man, I've been knowing you all these years <laughs> from church. I didn't know you, were, you, you had a whole nother life. I, wow. don't, I, don't, I don't talk. The reason I don't talk about it too much nowadays Cause it really doesn't matter when it comes to making a difference in a young person's life. I need okay. to I need to share more about God than that lifestyle. You know what okay. I'm saying? What God had brought me to and from. You know what I'm saying? When right. I got into a relationship with Him, right. so I don't I don't talk about it too much. I know, cause we done talked a whole bunch. <laughs> <laughs> I ain't never heard this story before. <laughs> wow. So so. How different of a person are you from what you used to dream you would be as a young person? What did you dream you would be? Oh, I dreamed I was going to be a professional football player. Okay. I played football from element, peewee elementary all the way up to high school. And uh, the crazy part about it, I couldn't play my 11th grade year because I went to the doctor. I took a physical. Uh -huh. And when I took the physical, they said I had an irregular heartbeat. Mm -hmm. And so when... They told me that they was like I couldn't play my 11th grade year. Wow! And I was devastated. I, I'm talking about I was devastated. I've always played football, and um, I ended up I was so devastated that I didn't even try to be with the team. I went and got a job. I didn't go to none of the football games or none of that. Wow! And then the crazy part when my 12th grade year came, then I went to the doctor and they cleared me to play. They said I didn't have an irregular heartbeat no more. Oh man! Wow, wow! When did you know you was gonna be okay, man? When did you know that life was gonna make a turn for you? Doing that time, mm -hmm. when I quit quit working at FedEx and 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 bought my first nine juices of cocaine, that's when I knew I was gonna be all right. You knew you was gonna be all right. When and you, and I didn't care if I died or, or whatever. I just wanted to survive and take care of my family. Well, now, how many kids did you have at that time? 
I had only two at that time. Yeah, then true. I had uh, my baby boy, which is Sin K. Right. And I had him like when I was turned, what, 22? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Wow. So what's your why, man? Why you get up every day? Why you wow. fight the good fight? My why right now is, 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 well, at that time it was my family. Okay. You know, my boys. I didn't want my boys to experience what I had experienced. Okay. My dad, had, you know, my mom and dad had divorced and when I was like four, um, not having him around. Um, I just wanted to be there for my boys like that. I, I wanted to be there. I wanted to be there when they went to school. I wanted to be there for whatever I could be there for because during them times I played football, I was really playing football mad. Mm. I, I share with my, my young people now that I was an angry football player. Okay. I said when 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 Friday night came and I didn't see nobody in the stands to root for me or my daddy not being there, mm -hmm. I was mad. Mm. And 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 I took all my anger out on hitting people. Like right now, my shoulder right now I got issues with this shoulder right now okay. just from hitting people. Wow. All right, this is the last question of the segment, and I want you to really think about it. When did you realize you realize? That you were a black man. Hmm. Hold on, real quick, real quick. Listen, <laughs> we're gonna be right back on the journey. And I tell you, man, this is hot. This is hot. So you stay right there, because we coming back with more Renato Baker after this. This is a journey. Let me take you on a journey. Success in life is not a straight line. There are twists and turns in everyone's life, and the more you know about their story, the more you'll understand the process. Kazuki and Media Group proudly presents The Journey, a show that features successful black men in Memphis telling their stories of their lives and the ups and downs they've encountered on their ultimate road to success. We believe The Journey will encourage young men and help them see that life is a journey. Watch The Journey, hosted by me, Larry Robinson. Brought to you by the Kazuki Media Group in partnership with the Delta Boule. Welcome back to the journey. I'm your host, Larry Robinson, and today we have Brother Renardo Baker. I told you, this is a powerful one. So stay glued to your seat because it's going to get better. So. Renardo, before we left, mm -hmm. I ask you point blankly, when did you realize that you yourself was a black man? Well, it, it came at one, one day um, after God and called me to ministry and I got to volunteering at a church, uh, working with the youth ministry and um, the church. Wait a minute, hold on real quick. So you were called to ministry were you still in the game when you was in ministry? No, nah, uh-uh. Okay. No, nah, uh-uh. No, nah, that that was over with. Uh, God came. God really showed me a whole different way okay. to live. Okay, we're going to go back. Well, let's go back to when you yeah. found out you were the black man. Because <laughs> I'm sitting there shooting y'all. Listen, y'all, I'm, I'm as excited as you all are. I'm sitting there like, wow, because this brother, I've been knowing this brother for a minute, and I ain't know any of this. So let's go back. Okay. When did you realize you was a brother? Well, um, like, like I said, it was it was this time I was at a church. Okay. And um, they ended up doing a background check on everybody in the church. Oh. And I had shared with them, I was like, look, you know, in my past, I sold drugs. I, I got gun charges. I didn't even ran from the police. I didn't did all that. Okay. But I don't have a felony. Okay. You know, and... Uh, and so they ended up doing the background check, okay. and they got and they got to see the information on paper for real. Okay. And so when they seen it, they stopped me from praying with the kids. They stopped me from preaching, the whole nine. And I was so hurt. I'm Wait talking a minute, about, was this is, is this a black church? Yeah, it's a black church. But I ain't gonna I ain't gonna say yeah, that. Yeah, no, I, we don't want yeah, one more out. It was one more out. Yeah, it was a black church, and so. So uh, they stopped you from being around the kids. Made me sit in the back. Okay, well, come on, finish up. And so, Why you, when you found out you was a and, brother. And, and so, 
Um, and I was so mad. But during that time, God had led me to the Orange Mound Community Center. Okay. To to you know be with the kids, right. and that's where I, I I really started my own thing. Okay. And um and God told me He said He said Who sent you up there to that community center? I said You did God. And He said Well you keep going. And I said Well I'm 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 finna leave that church. He said No you're not. You ain't finna leave that church. You gonna stay there. He said Did Jesus leave when the Pharisees was challenging him? And I, and I was like, no. Nah. He said, well, you're going to keep going. And so I stayed. I stayed. They had me sitting down for about six months. I did not leave. I sat in the back. I did everything they asked. So it came to a point where I ended up sitting, had to sit down with the pastor, the head pastor, mm -hmm. and the lady that was over the human resource. Right. And so and my mom was sitting there with them, and then they, they asked me questions like, could I get you know, my record expunged and all that. During that time, I couldn't, right, you know. Right, right, And the pastor looked me in my eyes and told me that I would never be able to work for a ministry with a record like I had. And uh, and I was hurt. And I told God, I said, God, I could have stayed in the streets if I, if, if I know it's going to be like this. Mm -hmm. And that was the point that I felt like I was, I was black. But I wasn't a certain black. Mm. You, you see what I'm saying? A certain black. A certain black individual that didn't meet a criteria or a way of being for the, for the, for the static quo of people, you know? And well, in that paradigm anyway. Okay. And so me being at the Orange Mound Community Center really put me back in the grassroots of where I came from. Okay. And, and from there... I've grown to be who I am now. Did and you now, stay? Did you stay at the church? Oh yeah, I stayed there after I got hired at Red Zone Ministries. Okay. I kept going to the church. I ended up taking. I had a 15 passenger bus. Okay. I had 20 young people on that bus, go, taking them to their Wednesday night of youth service. Wow. And then I knew then that God wanted to show, show them that He was with me. And that he that that he was with me, he was walking with me, he had anointed me, and to see that I could draw a large number mm -hmm. of young people into the church. But the crazy part about it is that those young people had the same DNA I had. They mm -hmm. was they were they they were scared of them kids too. They were scared of the kids at the church. And and so, but the youth pastor. The, at that time, and he put a team together that, that really kind of nurtured those young people up. Right. In which they ended up leading the, the uh, youth church and all that. Mm -hmm. But even right now today, those kids don't even go there no more. Wow. Man. So let's go to when you got the calling, when mm -hmm. God said, you ain't, you ain't going to do this no more. Well, uh, it started where I, I ended up catching a charge, okay. and I was facing eight years. Okay. And uh, right there, I, I, I stopped. I ended up opening a wing and record store at South Parkway and Kerr. Okay. And um, my friend came. Wings and record store. Yeah, yeah. I was selling <laughs> CDs at the time. I was selling <laughs> CDs on one side, wings on the other side. <laughs> and... Um, and my partner came and got me, and he took me to this church, and it was a big church. And I looked, and he was, he was like, what you think about it? What you think about it? I said, man, this is a nice church. I've never been in a church this big. Uh -huh. And uh, I ended up, I, I, I told God, I said, I'm going to at least go on Wednesday nights. I can't go on Sunday nights because I'm still partying. I'm still doing this. But Saturday we, night. You yeah. Saturday night. <laughs> and so Wednesday night ended up turning to Sundays. And and I started going on Wednesdays and Sundays, and I never forget. I was sitting in the congregation, and it was like God was telling me to get up and join, but I wouldn't move. And it was this lady with some red glasses, dark skin, and kind of heavy set, and she was one of the ushers. And she came down, and she looked me dead in my eyes, and she reached her hand out to me, and I knew then that was God telling me to come on. And wow. I and I and I got up. And I stood in front of the people. I would cry. My mom was like, it's not tears. <laughs> everything run down my face. And, uh, 
and and there I gave my life to Christ and from there I just read the Bible consistently read the Bible consistently okay and I was still smoking weed at the time right and then one one day I had to go pick up my son from school right and um uh, picked him up from school but I'm, I'm I'm sitting there right in the front of the school where he got to come out of it right and and I end up listening to this music that my cousin had brought from Gary, Indiana. Okay. Because one of my cousins got shot and killed okay. in Gary. And so I'm listening to the music, and, it was, and the son was talking about God. Okay. And, and they was asking God why their life was the way it was, you know, mm-hmm. why their daddy had to leave, and why they have to struggle to eat and all this. Right. And, I was, and the music was like just hit me, and I was like, hey, this is it. This is, this is the music. Uh-huh. And... Uh, and, and so I ended up, my son came out, and I just kept talking about God, talk, kept talking about God, and my cousin said, you know what? You've been touched. And I'm like, touch? I'm like, what touch mean? I don't know what touch mean. <laughs> he said, you you consistently talking about God, but then this is what stuck with me. He told me, he said, but it's going to wear off. And I said, it's going to wear off? I don't want this to wear off. So I dug in the Bible even more to even understand what does this touch mean? Okay. And that's when I came to the realization that I had an encounterment with the Holy Spirit. Mm-hmm. And uh, and from there, I stopped smoking weed, cold turkey. I stopped selling dope, cold turkey. I mean, I still had some drugs and, and money in my phone. I gave my the drugs to one of my partners. I gave the phone to him. I said, you can do it if you want to, but I'm done. And... uh. And that and, and the journey started even How more. How old were you when you gave it all everything up? I was twenty about twenty eight. About twenty eight. Yep. Wow. So when was Saint Nardo born? Saint Nardo was born doing the music. Okay. That time I went on my journey doing music. I, I worked with my cousin them starting the ghetto boys. Yeah. Not the ghetto boys, but the uh, gutter boys. Gutter boys. And uh and I dumped a lot of my money that I had from that into that. Ended up losing forty thousand dollars in the music. Okay. Um, then when I got more involved with church and joined the youth ministry, mm-hmm. I started. I felt God like He wanted me to do gospel rap, mm-hmm. and so I got into all that. And um, but I had my wrestles with God during that time. Like, okay, do you want me to make music that's worship you, or do you want me to make music that's full of testimonies and that? And He was like. I want you to make music full of testimonies. He said, when you read Psalms, what, what do you hear King David saying? And it's just testimonies of his life and what he experienced, the ups and downs, the failures, the, the whole nine, you know? Mm. And so I, that's where St. Nardo came from. And, wow. and the saint was in front of Nardo because I had turned another leaf. I wasn't Nardo no more. I was St. Nardo. Okay. All right. Man. You're going to shock me. I'm over here and just stupefied. <laughs> um, tell me about the transition from you, because you, you're a father already. Mm-hmm. You transitioned from being um, a, a, a dope boy in the hood to being a youth advocate. Mm-hmm. When did that transition happen? Because you went from dealing with the, the drug addicts and everybody else and the dope boys to now you dealing strictly with youth. Because mm-hmm. that's all I see you doing now. Mm-hmm. I mean, mm-hmm. I even see you at the Melrose games, mm-hmm. every game. Mm-hmm. Yeah, like so, a father. Yeah. And, that, and um, so the transition that happened when, when pretty much when, when God gave me his spirit. I stopped that. I got into youth ministry uh-huh. and from being at the church I was at, I started at the Orange Mound Community Center. Right. And from there, I would, and got hired at uh, Red Zone Ministries. Right. And so when I got hired there, it was like, it gave me access. Uh-huh. It gave me access to, to youth all through Orange Mound. Okay. And so, and the number one thing God had challenged me on, he said, now I want you to treat these young people like they're your sons and they're your daughters. He was like, don't don't show no favoritism. Don't bring your kids around. But as they see you operate with your kids, you operate in the same format with them. How did you deal with the other dope boys and stuff? How did you deal with those people from the former life? 
because you had to cut ties on yeah, some yeah. level, or did you? Well, yeah, I cut ties with them. Uh, and, and during that period of time, some of them went to jail. Right. Um, one of them uh, died. And um, so they had they more isolated moments mm. where they wasn't around. But when they did come back around, they was hearing about St. Nardo. Mm. And Nardo worked with the kids because, you know, the community, the hood don't never stop talking. Right. Once you, once you didn't hit that level of being that individual, they want to keep up like, what are you doing? What is right. he doing that? What right. is he doing that? So now I'm back in the community, but I'm, I'm, I'm helping young people. Wow. And they and even right now today, they they applaud me. They 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 support me. They say, "Hey man, All you former- changed. You changed, and you doing a good thing." It was even to the point some of their kids, I had to minister to. Mm. Some of their kids, I had to minister to. Even some of the drug addicts that I used to say adult to, I had to minister to their kids too. It was like my redemption. Wow, that's powerful, man. So let me ask you, what, what role has Memphis overall played in your life? Man, Memphis is what made me. Okay. Just 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 the, the, the community of Orange Mound, you know. Um just the, the the everything, the way I was the way I saw things, the way I handled things. Mm-hmm. Um just to just to take nothing. Mm-hmm. And make it into something. Mm-hmm. Taking a lawn service, there was nothing. Didn't have no understanding how business ran or anything like that. Mm-hmm. But with the ability to take that and make it into something. Right. To be able to take Ash and I that believe from nothing to make it to something. That's what Memphis has done for me. Mm-hmm. And and it, and it allowed me to understand that nothing is given. Right. Everything is earned. Right, and if you're gonna earn it, you got to be your character has to be in line. You have to be a a, a righteous person, and, mm-hmm. and just stand on your word. Wow. So Malone Lawn Service, mm-hmm. where does the Malone come from? Oh, uh, my grandfather, he was doing it at first, and okay. then I ended up taking it over from my uncle. Okay. Because how I got in the business, I was praying to God. I was like, God, I I I need to do something. I got this money, but I need some type of income. And um, seeing my uncle cutting my grandmama yard down the street from my mother's house, mm-hmm. and uh, and and I asked, I said, "Hey, I want to get in the business." Okay. And um, I put ten thousand into getting into the business, and I've been doing it ever since. Okay. All right. Now your business is somewhat of a ministry as well. Oh yeah, yeah. I'm a lot of my young people that I, uh, young men that I've ministered to, mm-hmm. I was able to get them jobs. Mm-hmm. And uh, you know the crazy part about it, out of out of all of them that I didn't hire, I have lost three of them how to many, gun violence. How many do you believe you've hired over the mm. years? <laughs> I want to say about about fifteen, maybe twenty. And, and three of them you've lost to gun violence. Yep, they actually worked inside. Got in the truck, went and did the yards, everything. Yeah. Man, what was that day like when you found out that one of your kids, one of the guys you were ministering to, was no longer with you? Well, I take you um, the year two, what, 2017, I lost five young men to gun violence in one year. Uh, and that's where three of them got killed in that year too. And so uh, I went to another part of my life that I really didn't understand, mm-hmm. and that was my emotions. Okay, I understood the spiritual side, you right. know, God, this, but God allowed me to understand that I had emotional side that I hadn't tapped into yet. Okay. And, uh, and so I ended up going into depression. Mm. And at uh, that point, I didn't want to deal with no more young people. I didn't want to do youth ministry no more. I told God I was done. I went back to cutting grass. I would say I'd rather be out here with the with the snakes and with the mosquitoes and spiders instead of being hurt like that again. Mm-hmm. And uh, <laughs> God's funny. He, he came back. Mm-hmm. He said, I ain't done with you yet. And after I learned how to 
con you know, gain control of my emotions. Or I, I read a book called The Voice of the Heart, and it allowed me to understand the eight emotions of how we wired up. Well, say that again now, just for those in the back that might not hear. <laughs> it taught me how to deal with my eight main emotions. No, the book. Tell them oh, the book. Oh, The Voice of the Heart. The voice of the Heart. Yes, sir. The Voice okay. of the Heart. Okay. And uh, it taught me that we're wired up to have emotions, but we can also use them in a negative way, and we can use them in a positive way. Okay. And it taught me how to manage them in the middle where I can, I, I can feel them, but I can handle them in a positive way. Okay. And so God's like, I'm not done with you. And he said, now you know how it feel to lose five multiple people in one year. And if you witness today, our young people experience losing multiple people in one year. Right. And that, and that gave me the ability to even reach out to them even more, to take them from being emotionally disturbed to emotionally intelligent, just as God did with me when I was emotionally disturbed and I became emotionally intelligent. Wow, wow. Listen, we're coming to the end of this thing, but there's gonna be a lot of young people that are, going to, that are listening and viewing mm -hmm. you right now. I want you to look in that camera right there, and I want you to leave them with a Bakerism, a Renardoism, and even if you want to rap it, you can be a <laughs> Saint Nardoism, but please talk to them and let them remember this moment. Hey, number one thing, learn about your emotions. Don't allow your emotions to guide you and lead you into a negative state where you might hurt someone, that you might rob someone, steal, kill, but gain control of them. And as you gain control of them, then you can guide yourself, or better yet, let God guide you with love, where you can love your neighbors, you can love yourself, and whatever your dreams are, you'll be successful. That is, that is, the roadmap to success. Wow, wow. So I, I switched up our questions a little bit because I wanted you to finish talking to young Nardo. Young Nardo sitting in Orange Mound, Saturday morning, eating a bowl of cereal, mm -hmm. watching cartoons. You walk in the door with your I shall not die, and I shall not die but live on your shirt. What would you say to young Nardo. Man, keep being you. Keep being you. Keep moving forward. Okay. Keep keep being driven by God. Keep letting him lead you. Even when you thought you was talking to God, he was really right there with you. So keep going. Follow God, let him guide you, and everything else is history. Wow. I shall not die, but live. Hey, Denzel said it. Don't aspire to make a living. Aspire to make a difference. Brother Bernardo Baker is making a difference. We are a better community because of individuals like him, because he's lived on both sides. So he can help you navigate that transition. Listen, I'm your host, Larry Robinson. This has been another episode of The Journey. For me, the team here at Kazookian, and Brother Bernardo Baker, keep coming back. We're going to keep bringing them. Till the next time. Thank you to our partners at Nike's Black Community Commitment and Methodist Labonner Healthcare. To hear more incredible stories like this, be sure to download the Kazookian app from the App Store or Google Play, or check out the Journey Memphis podcast on all your major podcast providers. Also, check us out on the Kazookian Network. Mm -hmm.